وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to your show Inspirations uh, We were last time talking about the situation of the world just before the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We were talking about the Byzantine Empire we talked about uh, the Persian Empire, the situation there socially, economically, religiously as well. Uh, and uh, I believe we had a good, or we have formed some kind of a good idea and good perception of how the world was at that time. Just to clarify uh, or to give more clarity on the, how, on the state of the world at that time, we will inshallah talk today about the state of like India and, Egypt and uh, China. Then we will talk about the state of the Arabs to see the surroundings of the Prophet وسلم, what kind of environment he had to deal with and what challenges he had to face. As you all know that the first Saturday of every month we have a live show. We will go live the first Saturday of every month. So we will be expecting your calls. So you can call in. Inshallah we will take your comments. Uh, but with these recorded episodes, we will always receive your emails. You all know our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Again, this is inspirations at huda.tv. So, so do write to us. Uh, what do you think about the show? What, maybe, maybe you have some new ideas. We can benefit from them. We can incorporate that into the show. Inshallah, to give more benefit to ourselves and to our viewers. So uh, last week, as I said, uh, I believe we have developed a good understanding, a good perception of how the world was at that time. All the darkness, all the oppression that prevailed, and some elite, a limited number of people were controlling the world, were controlling their nation or the lands under their control, and they abused their people, they abused the wealth, they abused the resources, just for the sake of having and enjoying a life of luxury. Like in the Byzantine Empire, the issue of slavery was very rampant. Slaves were considered even less than animals in terms of dignity, in terms of respect, in terms of rights. The animals had more rights than the slaves. Uh, in in uh, Persia, uh, the people were maybe not necessarily enslaved as in the sense with the Byzantine Empire, but the people had uh, no dignity as human beings. They had uh, no rights to a decent life. Uh, or a good kind of income because even their own works like farmers, uh, craftsmen, people who worked, all the benefits, all the wealth they made was taken to the kings of the Persians because they considered their rulers to be from the progeny or from the descendants of their own gods. So they were superior, they considered themselves superior to normal human beings and they had more rights. They had the rights to abuse the people, exploit their wealth exploit their efforts, exploit their families, and they could actually take a son from his father, sell him wherever they wanted, and do whatever they want with him. That was very common in that uh, state. This is why so many people, so many farmers, left their work, they abandoned their crafts, and they decided to sit at home, or to live in seclusion, or to live in remote areas where they could enjoy some kind of uh, autonomy, where they could live uh, a decent life and they could look after themselves. So this was the case in the surroundings area, surrounding areas like uh, Persia, which actually it controlled what is known today as Iran, some parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and some parts of Turkey and Iraq today. The Byzantine Empire, we said it ruled over a natural Syria like Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Sinai and Egypt, uh, most of North Africa, the, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, Greece, the Balkans, it, uh, not necessarily Italy, because Italy was under the 
reign or under the control of the Western Roman Empire, which actually uh, broke down and uh, was destroyed totally as a nation or as an empire. And uh, the Byzantines used to call these uh, the people there as the uh, the uh, barbaric generations or the barbaric tribes, uh, because they had the Vikings, such as the Vikings and the Austrians and all that, all these tribes and all these nations. They considered them to be barbarians. And uh, actually, it's, it is from that time, uh, which is about uh, 500 CE until, uh, which is from the 5th century to the 10th century, this era was called the Dark Ages in Europe. That was the rule of the barbarians, wh wh whom they call the barbarians. So let's move to the east, talk about a little bit about India and China. In India, when that time, which was the 7th century CE, that was the worst in the history of India because uh, the caste system was in effect and it controlled the whole uh, lifestyle of India. They had different castes or different levels of people, different ranks of people. They had the Brahmins. The, Br the Brahmins are considered to be the priests of their own religion. And uh, these Brahmins considered themselves to be superior. They could do whatever they wanted. There was nothing prohibited for them. They could oppress others. They could uh, do injustice. All what they had to do is to enjoy themselves and enjoy their superiority over the others. Uh, the second level was the warriors, men of war, and they enjoyed a life of luxury as well. Uh, then comes third, the uh, peasants, the farmers, and the tradesmen and merchants. And these people enjoyed some kind of, we can say, middle class kind of life. Uh, they had some rights because they had the wealth there. And the worst, which was the majority of the people there, these were considered to be the servants or the slaves. And these people, uh, according to the Indian myth and according to their own religion, they claim that these people or this rank of people, the lowest rank of people who are the common people or the laymen, uh, they were considered to be servants because they were created, as they claimed, from the feet of their God. So they are of an inferior position to the others. So the caste system actually brought a lot of prejudice, a lot of discrimination in their lives, a lot of exploitation uh, from the part of the uh, superior ranks, and uh, they oppressed the others. And culturally uh, and scientifically, India lived in the lowest and the most decadent stages of its own history. And then actually uh, what characterized that era in India was the internal wars they had among uh, different kingships, among different uh, kings and rulers. And so many people died in these wars. Uh, so this was basically, in brief, the case in India. China was no better than that. As to the uh, standard of living in terms of the wealth, there was a lot of there was wealth there. There was a life of luxury to the superior rank, uh, ranks in the society. So enjoy, they enjoyed that kind of life as well. Uh, that was the same as well with the high-ranking uh, castes, like in uh, the Byzantine Empire and in the Persian Empire. Now this was the outer world, the known world there. As to Abyssinia, was mainly living in poverty. Uh, the Christians were there. Uh, it was basically attached or affiliated to the Roman Empire. It didn't have that much, I can say, superiority and strength as an empire, but it was affiliated with the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire before its collapse. So this was the case of the world. Now let's move close to Arabia. Let's talk about the state of the Arabs. The state of the Arabs was very interesting actually and there are so many aspects of their lives that we will try to explain because by explaining that inshallah we can see or we can develop a better understanding of what surroundings the Prophet wasallam had to live in and this will give us an idea what he had to face, what he had to deal with and what are the changes that he brought. So we get to know and develop a good understanding of his life why, and his mission because we are putting things in context. Now let's talk about uh, the religious situation in the Arabian Peninsula or the religious situation of the Arabs in general. Now we stated previously last week 
that the Arabs were upon the uh, religion of Ibrahim, peace be upon him. They followed that religion. But as we said, uh, as time was passing by, they started to lose some of the aspects of this religion. They started to add some new aspects to the religion of Ibrahim, peace be upon him. They added new things and they considered that to be uh, the religion of Ibrahim. And changes, innovations were introduced to the religion until it changed most of it, especially the essence of it, which is Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was changed. Although they maintained some of the rituals and some of the practices. So polytheism became very widespread among the Arabs. In Mecca, the Kaaba itself was surrounded by 360 idols being worshipped by the Arabs. Imagine that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim to build al Kaaba, to build the Kaaba in order to establish monotheism and worship of Allah, uh, in order to establish monotheism, worship of Allah alone. But now the Arabs actually used it to uh, spread and to propagate and to legislate polytheism and association of partners along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we stated that polytheism started in the Arabian Peninsula, more, sp uh, more specifically in Mecca, uh, by Amr ibn Luhay. Al-Khuza'i, the man who brought the idol Hubal from Asham, from natural Syria. So, a glimpse on the religious situation of the Arabs at that time reveals that the Arabs still maintained some of the remains of the religion of Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them. Things like that were circling the Kaaba, the circumambulation of the Kaaba was still there seven times. That was a ritual first done by Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the Arabs maintained that. But what they added to it were the idols that they placed surrounding the Kaaba and they were touching these uh, idols, seeking their blessings while they were making this tawaf or this circling of the Kaaba. Another thing was, another ritual, Abrahamic ritual, which is an Islamic one, is a sa'i between the Mount, of, Mount Safa and Mount Marwa, seven times as well. This was from the rituals performed by Ibrahim, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Standing in Arafah during the day of Arafah, the ninth of uh, Dhul Hijjah, uh, standing for that uh, during the, the day in Arafat, that was a ritual made by Ibrahim, and the Arabs maintained that. Although the people of Quraysh actually did some alterations to this. More, all of the Arabs used to stay in Arafat, but the Quraysh, they used to stay in Al Muzdalifah. They, called themse they gave themselves the name of Al-Hums. They said, we are superior to the other others, so we have to have this kind of distinction. Later on, uh, or other, uh, other actions, other rituals that were maintained from the religion of Ibrahim was as well to go to Mina, spend the night uh, there. And even the most important thing is acknowledging that the Creator was Allah. And this is clearly mentioned in the Quran. Allah commands the Prophet to argue with the people of Quraysh, the polytheists. Allah commands him to ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? And they said, it is Allah who created the heavens and the earth. They knew that. Okay, Allah said to Muhammad sallallahu ask them, who maintains this world, this universe? Who takes care of it? They said Allah. So they acknowledge the truth that Allah is the only creator. Allah is the true God. But they say that these gods, we worship them so that they get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that was severely and totally changed from the religion of Ibrahim was the concept of the hereafter, of a second life. Now, this actually was wiped out totally among the Arabs. They, uh, as time passed by, they lost the belief in the last day and they uh, thought or they came to believe that it is only this life that we will live and there will be no other life. Uh, once we die, that's the end of it. There will be no other life, as we said. Now let's see another, some other aspects of the religious situation in the Arabs. Now as most of the Arabs embraced the religion of Ibrahim, along with the changes and with the alterations, still there were some other religions prevalent among the Arabs, but... Uh, to a very limited extent. For example, the Arab tribes who were in natural Syria, in Asham, these tribes like al the Ghassanide, al Ghassasina, these people, some of them embraced, or most of them embraced the Christianity because they were affiliated and they were subordinate to the Byzantine Empire. So they accepted the, relig the religion of Christianity 
and they became Christians. Uh, other uh, other tribes, Arab tribes, that were present in Iraq and to the north of uh, or northeast of the Arabian Peninsula, they embraced the religion of the Persians, the Magian or uh, Zoroastrianism. They embraced that religion and they followed it. Uh, some Arabs actually had the belief of Sabianism, worshipping celestial bodies, worshipping the sun, the moon and the stars. So these were some religions available among the Arabs. But there was one religion still there, but in a very, li in a very limited scale, according to a very limited scale. That was the religion of Ibrahim. Some of it remained, some people remained upon the religion of Ibrahim, which is Al-Islam, al Hanifiya. Okay, they remained on that. We will mention or we will list some of their names and what happened to them later on, inshallah. And we will find more about them and about other aspects of the life in the Arabian Peninsula after we have this short break. So stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Space, an endless void whose secrets are still unknown to science. A flawless system of billions of galaxies and the stars, planets, comets, asteroids, and clouds of gas and dust all moving together in perfect harmony. It is just Allah's way to make our spirit. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. We are still trying to explain and to make a clear picture of how the world looked like just before the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Understanding how the world was, how much darkness and oppression and injustice there was in the world will help us understand the sequence of events and will help us appreciate uh, what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions what they did and what they uh, introduced to humanity. We were talking about the religious situation among the Arabs. We mentioned some of their religions or some of the religions that they embraced and they believed in. And uh, just before the break, we mentioned that some individuals were known among the Arabs to be upon the exact religion, the pure religion of Ibrahim, peace be upon him, that was Islam. Among these people was uh, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Now Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, uh, as I mentioned last week, was a person who did not like the worship of idols. He realized it wasn't, tr it wasn't truth because it was against the human nature to worship stones, worship other than the creator. So he decided to set out in search for the truth and he met uh, a Jewish rabbi and he asked him to follow his way the rabbi said to him, you have to take your portion of Allah's wrath. And then after that, you will join us. He said, it's Allah, Allah's wrath that I'm running away from. So he, then he, he said, I don't want that. He said, okay, the rabbi, the rabbi told him that if you don't want Allah's wrath, then you, it seems that you want to follow the religion of Ibrahim. You can find that in your homeland, in Mecca or in al Medina, Because uh, that rabbi knew from his scriptures, from the scriptures he had, that the Prophet ﷺ will be sent or would be sent in that area. So he went and he met a Christian priest. The Christian priest gave him some conditions that he has that he had to meet before entering Christianity. But he didn't like that because it, it constituted believing that Allah inca was incarnated into the form of Jesus. Peace be upon him. We say, A'udhu Billah from this evil and from this blasphemy. Allah is high above that and Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was a prophet like other prophets. So he turned away from him and he went back to Mecca. And actually historians say that Amr ibn, Amr, Amr ibn Nufayl, well actually it was Aisha, uh, may Allah be pleased with her, uh, that narrated that Amr ibn, ibn Nufayl used to sit, as it was very known among the Arabs, that Amr ibn Nufayl used to sit and uh, lean his back towards the Kaaba or on the Kaaba and he would say to the Arabs okay by Allah there is none none of you is upon the religion of Ibrahim except me 
So he was upon the religion of Ibrahim. He said, I don't worship your idols. He didn't eat the meat of uh, the sacrifice or the animals they sacrificed for the idols. He said, I only eat the meat that is sacrificed for the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So it shows that the remains of the religion of Ibrahim were, were there and they were known to the Arabs. And most of the Arabs actually realized that, they, that their forefathers introduced things to the religion of Ibrahim and they mixed it with polytheistic practices. Now Zayd ibn Amr ibn Mufayl as well was known for uh, his generosity and for one aspect which is very important because the Arabs, some of them, they had the habit of burying their daughters alive because they thought that women brought shame to the family. Especially those tribes who were engaged in so many wars, uh, they always uh, feared the fact that their daughters could be taken into captivity and then they would become a source of shame because they, would, they were raped and they were made into slaves. So they decided to get rid of their daughters as soon as they were born or as soon as they reach, reached an, an early age like two or three years. So Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, whenever he saw a man intending to bury his own daughter alive, he would say, listen, give her to me. I will take care of her. So this man, ha it shows that this man had generosity. And uh, so he would take this girl and bring her up, look after her, feed her until she becomes grown up. Then he would turn to his, her father and say, listen, she's grown up now. If you would like to take her, you can take her and take care of her. If you would like to leave her, then I will take care of her and I will secure her uh, a decent marriage. So it shows and reveals the beautiful character of this man who believed in the religion of Ibrahim, who was living according to his natural disposition, the fitrah that Allah put in our hearts. So even Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl on the day of resurrection will come by himself between the nation of Muhammad and the nation of Isa and Musa, peace be upon them. So he will come as a nation by himself because he was a real seeker of the truth. And it shows that, or the lesson that we can take from his story is that if you are sincere to find the truth and if you uh, try to be neutral, don't take any, uh, don't accept any kind of preconditioning or presumptions. Just come and approach Islam with a neutral attitude, seeking only the truth, and Allah will guide you to it. Allah will guide you to the truth, and you will find it. But if you already have prejudice and preconditioning, you will not arrive at the truth, definitely. So that was the case of Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Another monotheist person was Waraq ibn Nawfal. Waraq ibn Nawfal was the uncle of Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet wasallam. And we will come to mention his story, inshaAllah, how he supported the Prophet wasallam. Because, he, But Waraq ibn Nawfal believed in the religion of Ibrahim and he was waiting for that. Some historians say that he, wa, he embraced the religion of Christianity. Okay, so both cases, whether he was Christian or he was upon the religion of Ibrahim, these actually do not conflict inshallah because it seems that he followed the original religion of Jesus, peace be upon him, which was Islam. So it was the same way as Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now there was Qus ibn Sa'id al-Ayadi, a very well-known poet. And uh, actually the uh, historians mention some of his poetry, which is very beautiful. He used to come to the big markets, the festivals or the bazaars that were very well known in Mecca during the time of pilgrimage. And he used to narrate to them poetry, talking about the reality of this life and that there must be a next life. There must be hereafter, must be there and people must be held to account. Uh, another person was Umayyah ibn Salt. Umayyah ibn Salt was upon the religion of Ibrahim. But when, and he lived and witnessed uh, the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, but he was so arrogant to accept the message of Islam and he refused to abide by the commands of Muhammad وسلم, so he died as a kafir after he uh, uh, did not accept Islam. Another very important person who was upon the religion of Ibrahim was the famous poet Labid ibn Rabi'a. Now Labid ibn Rabi'a uh, was one of the poets of Al-Mu'allaqat, the very well-known poems that were hanged in the Kaaba, the seven, or some people say there were ten. Labid ibn Rabi'a was a very wise poet and he witnessed Al-Islam and he embraced Islam, he became Muslim and he died during the reign, during the Khilafah of, uh, of Uthman 
May Allah's peace and blessing, or may, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. Uh, he lived for 150 years. The Bid ibn Rabi'a, very famous. Uh, another person was one of the forefathers of Muhammad, Ka'b ibn Lu'ay ibn Ghalib. He was upon the religion of Ibrahim. He did not worship idols. And some historians say even Abdul Muttalib was upon the religion of Ibrahim, the grandfather of the, of the prophets. Abdul Muttalib was upon the religion of Ibrahim. He did not worship idols. Now, this is generally the religious situation in the Arabian Peninsula. Polytheism, and there were so many shrines made and erected for certain gods to be worshipped. But they all acknowledged that Allah is the only true God who deserves to be worshipped. And this is a fact clearly mentioned in the Quran because at the time of hardship, they only called on Allah. And they recognized that Allah was the creator. Now let's talk about the political situation in the, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. We know that uh, at that time, there were no proper states, there were no proper governments, but there was the tribal system. So people lived according to that system. A tribe would be the source of uh, solidarity, the source of loyalty. It was the object of loyalty. Everyone uh, attached themselves to their own tribe and they were loyal to it. They would fight, they would put their lives for the sake of their tribe, for the sake of the honor of their tribe. And the tribe was governed by one main person, that was the chief of the tribe. The chief of the tribe had a lot of respect, a lot of reverence, and he was obeyed by all the others. And he was a person, and actually he should be a person of experience. Most of the chiefs of the tribes were people of experience, people of a sound judgment, people of respect, people of wealth as well. They had to meet certain conditions in order to qualify to be the chief. And they used to inherit that from their fathers, actually. They had to have courage. They, uh, so they were brave people, very brave, especially at the time of war. They were very generous. They were very rich in the first place. And they would receive the guests for, regardless of who they were, and they would uh, make them actually stay at their own homes, they would provide, provide them with food, and they would even sacrifice their own souls in defense of their own guests. This generosity was very rec recognized and appreciated among the Arabs. Another uh, qualification that the chief, any chief of a tribe had was eloquence, because they could express themselves in a very eloquent way, in a very good way, they had very good presentation. This was one of the main qualifications of the chief, and they had something called, there is something called uh, a value called al muru'a in Arabic. Al muru'a means, actually it's a combination and an am amalgam of certain traits like bravery, uh, decency, uh, like uh, the desire to help others, uh, and intelligence, and some kind of uh, very respectable character that a kind of uh, feeling inside in the heart in the soul that pushes the person to do everything that is respectful everything that is good to sacrifice one's own benefit for the sake of others these were the characteristics of the chiefs of any tribe and in return the chief always received respect reverence and obedience so all the members of the tribe were expected to obey the chief. Another aspect of the political life of the Arabs, the Arabs were free people by nature. They never expected subservience. They never expected to be subjugated by others, except for some limited cases. But mainly the Arabs always loved freedom. This is why they traveled throughout the Arabian Peninsula. They avoided uh, being subjugated by other nations. This is why they preferred to live in the desert in the Arabian Peninsula rather than living in some fertile areas where they would be subordinate to other nations. So this is one important aspect in the life, or the political life of the Arabs. They never accepted humiliation. They were people of dignity and honor. Uh, another aspect of their uh, political life was loyalty. The concept of loyalty, as we just said, was restricted to the tribe. So this kept the tribe together and this made it as one unity, one political unit. So, and whatever the tribe decided to do, then all the individuals, all the members of that tribe were obedient to that and were loyal to that and they would show solidarity. Even if it were a war, if they were to go into a war or get themselves engaged in a war where they knew they would be totally destroyed, they would sacrifice their lives for that. 
because loyalty was a very important concept in their lives. Now let's move to talk about the economic situation in the Arabian Peninsula. And that, that is very important because it explains a lot of the resistance, a lot of the things that the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with. We know that the Arabian Peninsula is mainly made of desert. Very limited fertile lands, fertile uh, patches here and there, and oases. So uh, vegetation or agriculture was, very, was done there, was performed there, was available in the Arabian Peninsula in a very limited areas, very limited cases. So they didn't really engage themselves into agriculture. They used to uh, import uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, different things from the areas surrounding them. The only kind of, uh, the only kind of uh, uh, vegetation they had or agriculture they had was dates. Because dates were, ver especially in Medina, in Medina there were plenty of dates and not until today we know that. Because the uh, climate there was very suitable for dates. So that was the main thing of agricultural activity that they had. They had also like, uh, they had camels and they had sheep and they always looked after that. But because of the lack of vegetation there, it was also limited. It was considered to be wealth to have camels and to have sheep. Actually, a person's wealth was calculated according to the number of his camels or the number of his sheep. So this was the agricultural situation. And, you know, looking after sheep or having sheep and camels, this caused the Arabs and compelled them to travel from one area to another, looking for uh, or searching for some vegetation and uh, to grass their sheep and camels. As to crafts, the Arabs had so much pride not to get themselves into crafts. So, so they didn't uh, get themselves involved into crafts. Actually, they left that for slaves and they left that for non-Arabs. So you could hardly find an Arab blacksmith or an Arab carpenter. They always brought people, carpenters, blacksmiths, uh, any craftsmen. They brought these, even builders. Uh, they brought these people either from outside the Arabian Peninsula or they uh, trained their slaves to uh, become skillful in such crafts, then they would abuse them and uh, exploit them in that regard. So the Arabs always felt very haughty when it comes to crafts and to getting involved in that. Uh, the main occupation of the Arabs was trade. So most of them were merchants. And this actually, uh, they took advantage of the situation or of the location of the Arabian Peninsula because actually it's in the middle, it's the junction, it's the joining point of three, the three main continents or the three known continents at that time, Asia, Europe and Africa. So the Arabian Peninsula is just right in the middle. So all the trade routes were passing through the Arabian Peninsula, uh, especially Mecca. So all the goods coming from China, India, through the sea, through the Indian Ocean, to the Arab Sea, then to Arabian Peninsula, and from there by land going either to Europe or to Africa. And everything was coming from Africa actually, most of the time would be uh, sent to the Arabian Peninsula, then to Asia and to Europe. And anything coming from Europe was passing through the Arabian Peninsula as well. So it, its uh, location in the middle of the three continents known at that time gave it advantage in terms of trade. So the Arabs really took very good advantage of that and they got themselves involved in uh, trade and they utilized that very well. So uh, the strategic location of the Arabian Peninsula really gave it merit in terms of uh, trade. And uh, the people of the cities, the inhabitants of the, city, of the cities, the main cities, they were the ones who got themselves, who became merchants. As to the Bedouins who were traveling, they limited themselves to only uh, like looking after their sheep and their camels. And uh, another thing that really promoted and enhanced trade in the Arabian Peninsula was pilgrimage. Because the Arabs from all around the Arabian Peninsula always came during the Hajj or the pilgrimage season to perform Hajj and to trade. So they had so many markets or so many festivals uh, and uh, bazaars like Ukav, there was Dilmi Jannah. 
uh, or the Majanna and Dhul Majaz, the, these were very famous markets during the Hajj season. People came and exchanged goods and money and wealth. And this is why uh, actually trade flourished around the Arabian Peninsula, especially in Mecca during the Hajj season. And this made the people of Quraysh very rich. Some of them, they became v extremely rich people. And we will see what's the impact of that on the message of Islam when it arrived. And uh, this actually, there are more aspects to talk about the uh, economic situation in uh, Mecca and in the Arabian Peninsula in general. We will explore that more, inshallah, after we have this short break, so stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sent his followers to the four corners of the earth. And over the centuries, there were high points for Muslims, and there were also low points. Muslims were kings and slaves. And in all different uh, aspects of life. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. Uh, you can still write to us, uh, you know, our email address. It will appear on the screen, inshallah. Inspirations at huda.tv. This is again, inspirations at huda.tv. Just before the break, we were talking about the financial or the economic situation in the Arabian Peninsula. We said the Arabs took advantage of their location, the location of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and they became very rich merchants. Uh, actually, the Arabs, in order to secure a better kind of trade with other areas, like with the Byzantine Empire, with, the, uh, uh, with Abyssinia, and with the Persian Empire, even with India and China, they made very good relationships, for truces and agreements and treatments, uh, or agreements with other uh, treaties, they made some treaties with other nations, like with the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, in order to secure the routes of trade. And this actually promoted and enhanced the economic situation of the merchants of Mecca, and they became extremely rich, and they had their own trades or trade uh, journeys. So this actually prompted and uh, enhanced, as I said, the trade in Mecca. One aspect which is very important was the uh, prevalence of riba, usury, the concept of interest, interest-based loans. That was very, and it was compound kind of interest. Uh, people or the rich people in Mecca always lend others money and they would take according to very high interest rates. And we know, know that usury is very destructive. And the kind of economic catastrophe we are facing today in the world is actually the result. Or the price hike, you know, the prices are going really up and life is becoming very difficult. Everyone is complaining about the high prices, about the uh, living costs, the uh, People are really suffering from that. All of this, by the way, is the result of the world economic system that is based and founded on riba, on usury, on interest. It is not interest, it's a disaster. And uh, economic experts, they know that very well, but they don't want to do away with the riba, with the usury system. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve us from that and hopefully that Islam will introduce to humanity the correct economic system which will bring ease to everyone and will stop this control, this kind of monopoly of some certain and limited number of people who are controlling the whole world, who are pulling the strings by means of usury and riba. Okay, so that caused a lot of destruction to the social uh, status to the social st uh, situation in Mecca and in the Arabian Peninsula, because some people started to become richer and the poorer started to uh, the poor people started to become poorer, so the gap was getting bigger and the situation was getting worse. Now this takes us to the social situation. How uh, how did the people live? To their mannerisms. Uh, first of all, something very important, a very important characteristic of the life or the uh, Arabic, the culture of the Arabs, 
They always, always thought very high and of their genealogy. They always paid great attention and they placed a lot of pride. They hanged a lot of, tr a lot of pride on their genealogy. They traced it back to Ibrahim and even to more than that, beyond that. So this is why we know the science of genealogy has flourished among the Arabs and is, was very precise no knowledge and until today it exists. And there are people who can trace their genealogy back to Adam, the first man, although with some gaps, especially at very early times of history. Uh, something was uh, very important as well in the social life of the Arabs was poetry. Poetry was very important. A poet was considered to be among the elite, a very respected person. So whenever uh, an outstanding poet appeared in a tribe, they would always feel proud of him. They would boast of having such a poet. Uh, as to the women, let's come to the social status of the women. The status of women, most of the time women ha had no value in the society of the Arabs, the Arabian Peninsula. A woman was not respected. Uh, she was prevented, she was deprived of uh, inheritance. She didn't get her share of inheritance. So she was wronged at all scales of life. And she was actually given as part of the inheritance. Like for example, when a father dies, his wife was given to one of his sons from another wife. And sometimes his wife was given to his brother. When a person dies, his wife goes to his brother as part of his inheritance. So a wom wom a women were just like any commodity, like any object in the house, like any piece of furniture. This is how low the position of women there was there at that time. And women were always considered to be a source of shame because they always feared, the people as they had so many wars, they always feared that their daughters would be taken in captivity and that would be a source of shame to them. So this, is, this caused some of them to actually bury their daughters alive. Uh, despite all of this, in some tribes, the woman occupied a respectable and uh, a very noble position. Like in Quraysh. In Quraysh, most of the time, a woman was respected, especially when she comes from a noble uh, lineage. Uh, she had full rights, like the man she would inherit, and she had the right to possess and to have wealth and to make trade. And uh, this is this was the situation of Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet <coughs> Sorry, she was very respected among her people, and there were so so many other women like that as well. But mainly, the woman had no respect; she had no value in the society of the Arabs. This actually leads us to talk about marriage. Now, there were so many different types of marriage; most of them. Uh, did not treat the women well. Uh, a man could marry any number of women he wanted. He could marry any woman. No limits at all. Some people actually were married to more than a hundred women. A person, one person, was married to more, uh, more than a hundred women. And there was no harm in that. People didn't see any problem with that. Another issue was divorce. A man could divorce his wife just like that, then marry her again, divorce her again. It was just like a joke. So. Marriage has, uh, or ma marriage at that time, had no sanctity, no value at all. A man could do whatever he wanted with regards to marriage. That, w that was a prophetic situation. But alhamdulillah, Islam changed all of this. So for those who attack Islam, saying Muhammad sallallahu wasallam came with oppression uh, of women, with injustice to women, and all of that, these people are totally unaware of how the world lived. Even in the, Byzantine, in the Byzantine Empire, in the Persian Empire, women had no value whatsoever. Now this war and, uh, was very common. People would, a tribe would just jump over another tribe and take their women, take their wealth and kill their men. That was very simple. That was very natural. Uh, as to knowledge, science, reading, now the number of people who were literate, who could read and write among the Arabs was very limited. Now, in the, if a tribe had one person who could write, now that was a privilege. So they were, they were, these people were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. Uh, but that actually gave them a very high level of intelligence. Now, an Arab could hear a poem of 2,000 line, lines for one time, and he could memorize it from that one time, from hearing it for one time. That, the Arabs had a powerful memory. 
And this is why they could trace their genealogy. They had the history recorded in memory. That was one characteristic of the Arabs. So they could memorize very quickly. Uh, and this was even until later stages after Islam. This was the case with many Arabs. They could memorize thousands of lines of poetry. Some people actually mem memorized the Quran from hearing it one time. Some of the surahs, some of the companions memorized them from hearing these surahs one time. So that was the state of the Arabs. Uh, we have something left talking about the Arabs, which is the uh, moral situation. Talking about the manners of the Arabs. And this actually would lead us to talk about Al-Jahiliyyah, the days of Al-Jahiliyyah. There is so much to talk about this. Next week, inshallah, we will talk about the moral situation, the moral life among the Arabs, the moral standards and values. And then we will move to talk about the concept of Al-Jahiliyyah. What does Al-Jahiliyyah mean? We will here delve into some of what the Orientalists had to say, some of the misconceptions uh, that they used in order to... Uh, cast some doubt on the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we'll bring this to light inshallah so next time be with us to know more about the moral situation of the Arabs more about some of what the Orientalists have to say about Jahiliyyah and its connection to Islam and we will have understand the broader sense of Jahiliyyah which is present until today we'll find out more inshallah next week so join us and be with us now I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our righteous deeds and to grant us his forgiveness and his mercy was alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa